Well, that was a great song. Thanks, Benji, for leading that, that last one. Just a reminder, isn't it, that Jesus is our Messiah. He is our blessed Redeemer, uh, the one who rescued us from our sins, which uh, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be here this morning. We'd still be lost in our sins. So, well, take your Bibles and turn with me again to the book of Titus. We're in Titus chapter 2 this morning. Titus chapter 2. One of the most important themes that we find in Scripture, and maybe even one of the most neglected themes in Scripture, is that of discipleship. Discipleship in the church is simply training the next generation to be godly, to help them to uh, please God. Now in the Bible, an older Christian man said to a younger Christian man, to his younger Christian friend, he said this, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That verse talks about discipleship. It's, the, it's passing biblical truth from one generation to another generation. It's the idea of helping us become, or helping others become better followers of Christ. Now, at the end of Christ's ministry, we know, and I'm sure we're all familiar with that verse where Jesus said to his followers, he said, you are to go and make disciples. You are to make disciples. And essentially, that has two aspects to it. The first aspect of making a disciple is that you would go to your friends who are unbelievers and you would share the gospel with them so that they can become Christians. That's one aspect of it. And then when they do become Christians, you want to share with them to help them grow in their faith so that they can become more and more like Christ. And so making a disciple has those two aspects to it. There's the aspect of salvation, and then there's the aspect of sanctification, helping them to grow in their faith. We need to disciple others. We need to do it. And we need to mentor others as well. This is a biblical mandate for everybody who is a Christian. And we've talked about this numerous times from this pulpit, but I think it's always good to be reminded of these things. And, and so let me say it this way. For those of you who are more mature saints, you have the responsibility to get alongside those who are less mature and help them to grow in the Lord. And the most appropriate way that we can do that, or probably even the most biblical way that we can do that, is that the older men should get alongside the younger men, and the older woman should get alongside the younger woman and, and help them as they grow in their faith. And as we open to uh, Titus chapter 2 this morning, we're going to see that this chapter is a discipleship chapter. It certainly affirms the importance of discipleship, and it shows the importance of training the next generation of believers. Now, this morning, the message is directed specifically to the men, as you can see by the title there. We're going to be talking about healthy men in the church. Now, you ladies, you do need to stay tuned in, and perhaps your main role this morning is just listening and hearing what these principles are and perhaps even filling out your prayer journal so that you can pray for us men that we would be all that God calls us to be. So don't tune out this morning, but make sure you're here next Sunday, you ladies, because you know what's coming, right? It's going to be a healthy woman in the church, and you certainly won't want to miss that at all although you actually might because it might be a challenging message, but anyway, don't miss it, come along. But just as we've been looking through the, the book of Titus, you know we've been on this journey, uh, just understanding more about the church, understanding more about the characteristics of a healthy church. And we've looked at a healthy church being one that would be led by spiritual leaders, and remember Titus gave us a whole list of qualifications in chapter 1 that we need to to use to identify who the leaders or the elders of the church should be. And, and so we've looked at that already, and we've seen that a key aspect of a healthy church is that they need to be committed to sound doctrine, and, and they need to be a church that affirms and embraces biblical truth. And we saw last Sunday that a healthy church is also one that can identify error and eliminate it from the church. And so chapter 1 has taught us a lot already, and it certainly had a lot to say directly to the leaders of the church. But as Paul writes this letter to his friend Titus, he's not just going to address the leaders of the church. He has something to say to every one of us, and that's what we're going to find in chapter 2 and chapter 3 as well. And 
In fact, in chapter 1, verse 5, Paul said to Titus, he said, I want you to set in order what remains and appoint elders. And we've already talked about what it means to appoint elders. Now we want to talk about those things that need to be set in order. So chapter 1 was more about leaders and elders. Chapter 2 now is about setting in order all of the things in the church that needed to be set in order. Well, I want to read to you, we're not going to look at all these verses today, but I want to read to you the first 10 verses of Titus chapter 2. Follow along with me. Paul says this, But as for you, addressing Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. Well, this is not, a, not an ideal chapter break, I guess you could say, at the beginning of chapter 2 here, because there is a very distinct, continuous flow of thought from what we've already looked at in chapter 1 and, and here into chapter 2. And even notice the very beginning of this chapter starts off this, but as for you. And so as Paul addresses Titus here in this letter, he's, he's contrasting Titus with what he has just said in the previous section. He's contrasting Titus with the Jewish false teachers that are mentioned in chapter 1 verses 10 to 16 that we looked, looked at last week. Remember those false teachers were guys who would come into the church and they were teaching Jewish myths and they were teaching traditions of men and they were probably overemphasizing some of the, the cultural ceremonies that were associated with their, with their background and they were teaching and upsetting families and we saw that and they were teaching stuff that was totally inappropriate. But Paul says to Timothy, uh, Tim, uh, sorry to Titus, Titus, in contrast to those false teachers, you don't be like them. You, Tim, you Titus, teach the truth. Teach what accords, he says, with sound doctrine. Teach what is healthy. And we've talked about this already, what is healthy doctrine. And we know that healthy doctrine can't have bits missing. Otherwise, it's not healthy, it's maimed. And healthy doctrine can't have bits that are distorted. Otherwise, it's not healthy, it would be diseased. And so t Titus is to teach sound doctrine, healthy doctrine. Teach truth that is going to strengthen the church. That's what he's telling him. Avoid all of that other wishy-washy stuff. Avoid those gimmicks. Avoid the traditions of men. Teach the truth. Teach sound doctrine. Teach biblical theology. And notice what Paul says here in verse 1. He says, he says teach what accords with sound doctrine. You could say it this way. Teach what fits with sound doctrine. Or teach things that are appropriate, I think the NIV says, for sound doctrine. Teach the things that are proper, that are in line with sound doctrine. And you might ask the question, well, what is it that fits with sound doctrine? What is, what is he talking about here? Well, well chapter 2 is going to explain to us what it is. Simply put, chapter 2 is all about ethical living. It is about good behavior that is so closely connected to sound doctrine. So ethics and good behavior and right living go hand in hand with sound doctrine. I've said to you many times, theology is practical, and here is another great example of it. Doctrine is relevant for all of us because good doctrine leads to good deeds as the the bottom of that um, thing on the PowerPoint there says, good doctrine 
good deeds. Doctrine and duty go hand in hand with each other. And to be honest, your behavior will always reflect what you believe. No matter what you believe, it will always be reflected in the way that you live. And so for Christians, we are to, we are to follow sound doctrine, which will lead to sound living. Perhaps we could put it this way. The right outcome to right doctrine is righteous living. That's the idea of what we're going to see here in chapter 2. And what is it that fits with sound doctrine then that, that Titus is to teach? Well, everything that he is about to say here in, in, in chapter 2, right to the end of the letter is what we're going to see, fits with sound doctrine. It's applicable to all of us. It's for all ages, for all generations, for both genders. We're going we're gonna to see more about the deep truths of God and God's attributes and Christ and salvation and our future hope. And we're definitely going to find a lot in this chapter and the next chapter about practical Christian Living. So Titus has this mandate to teach these specific issues, especially those relating to older men, older women, younger men, and younger women. And so this morning, we're just going to focus on what, what Titus needed to teach the men. And so the first group we want to look at this morning is the older men. We want to look at the older men. And now I'm sure some of you are wondering, what constitutes an older man? Well, Paul used this word of himself. If you read through Philemon, verse 9, Paul referred to himself as an older man, and we're pretty sure that Paul would have been in his 60s at that point. So you have to be at least 60 to be an older man. But then as you read through some of the Greek literature of the first century, the word older was used for somebody who was 50 years old. So the age is coming down. So as a, as a rule of thumb... If you're 50, or maybe you are fast approaching 50, then you need to listen carefully to what Paul has to say here to Titus. Or maybe you could say it this way, if your hair is turning gray, or if uh, you don't have to visit the hairdresser as often, then you, you need to take heed of these principles that we're going to see. And don't forget too, for those of you who are older men, 50-ish and above, these are qualities that the younger men need to see in your life. This is what we mean by discipleship. Young men look and learn from you, and you can teach them. So we're going to see here in this passage six, six character traits um, of a godly older man. The first three of these six are really just marks of maturity. What does it mean to be mature as a man? And the first one there is temperate. Temperate, you see there in verse 2. Older men are to be, my version says, sober-minded. I think most translations actually use the word temperate. The idea is to be moderate, not overindulgent. And so this word temperate can sometimes just be used in relation to wine. If a man is temperate, he doesn't drink to excess. But in this verse, I think it has a much wider meaning than that. An older man is to be known for his moderation in all of his tastes, in all of his habits. Whether he's eating or drinking or sleeping or spending or relaxing, whatever it is, he needs to live in moderation. He doesn't overdo anything. He lives his life, as it were, in the, in the safety zone, not in the danger zone. And he's not the kind of guy who's flirting with the excesses and the extremes of life. He's, he's not an overindulger. He's, he's temperate, everything in moderation. And this is actually a requirement for elders if someone wants to serve in the church as an elder. Not from the list we saw in Titus chapter 1, but from the list in 1 Timothy chapter 3. We all know that young men like to push the limits, right? They like to take risks. They like to push the boundaries. They like to live with the, the rev counter and the red but a temperate man starts to mellow out as his gray hairs decrease or increase. Sorry, He doesn't sleep until 11 a.m. like he used to when he was a teenager. He's content with the single cheeseburger. He doesn't eat three Big Macs every time he goes to McDonald's. He's not, he's not the kind of guy who's going to jump out of planes or off bridges or run through flames just for fun. Those things are put behind him. He's, he understands that he is no longer a teenager, and so now he is selective. He can prioritize his life. Some of the pointless things in his life just drop off the radar. If you're an older man, you need to be temperate. You need to slow down a little bit. 
Not only because you're getting older, but because you're getting wiser. Put away those youthful traits. You need to grow up. You need to be temperate. Live with the gauge on moderation. You need to be sober-minded. That's the first quality of an older man in the church, to be temperate. The second, uh, the second qualification that uh, Paul gives Titus here about the older men is that he is to be dignified. He is to be dignified. Sober-minded, then dignified. The NIV says it this way. He is to be one who is worthy of respect. It's the idea that he is to be serious about life. That doesn't mean to say he can't laugh or he can't have fun. I mean, being dignified is not a sentence to a boring, gloomy kind of life. No, this man can still have fun, but his fun and his laughter, it's clean, it's healthy. He doesn't laugh at ungodly things or immoral things or anything like that. His fun is within the bounds of godliness. A dignified man then doesn't just, doesn't play the fool. He's not a prankster, you know, he's, he's, he's not interested in getting involved in those student hostel pranks anymore when he was a younger guy. He guards his time, he's not a time waster, and he devotes himself to the more important issues of life. And because this man is older, he's, he's usually faced a lot of life's battles, and therefore he has a more serious view on life. He's seen tragedy, he's dealt with death, he's witnessed heartache, he's experienced hardship or loss. And he understands the preciousness of life and the significance of eternity. And so he is a dignified man. He avoids all of that trivial stuff. And he's experienced life for long enough not to fool around anymore. And so a dignified, a dignified man is not going to be the community PlayStation champion. He's, he's not going to win the local coloring in competition. He's got better things to do with his life and with his time. A good day for a dignified man is cultivating serious friendships and having genuine conversations and discussing real issues with people. And in this context, he uses his wealth of knowledge and experience to encourage and to bless the younger generation. That's what it means to be a dignified man, worthy of respect, one that younger men can come and learn much from this man because of the seriousness that he takes, that he takes in life. So he's dignified. The next one we see on this list is that he is to be one who is self-controlled. He is to be self-controlled. He's to have a, a sound mind. And this this quality has already been mentioned in Titus chapter 1, and it was one of the qualifications of an elder. You read that back in chapter 1, verse 8. This man, an older man then, is to be a clear thinker. He is to be prudent. You could translate it this way. He is to be sensible. He is to be self-controlled. In other words, he's to make good decisions. He is to be a master of his thought life. This is, this is not the impulsive guy who makes rash decisions without contemplating the, co the consequences. He makes sound judgments, not rash decisions. We all need, need men in our lives with this kind of quality. When you're looking for good advice or when you need some kind of help about some kind of major decision that you're facing in life, you need to go look for this kind of man, someone who's a clear thinker. And as you go to the church and you go to the older men in the church, you should be able to find this kind of man. A clear thinker doesn't get duped by all of the get-rich-quick schemes. This is the kind of guy who doesn't buy into the too-good-to-be-true strategies. He sees through all of that shallow marketing that happens in our world. You know, you must buy this product and it will change your life. He sees the stupidity of all of that marketing. He's not easily swayed by others. He's not the kind of guy that will sit down and watch infomercials for hour on end on TV. He's not that kind of guy. He is self-controlled. He's sensible. He's a clear thinker. And, and not only that, he's able to trans, transition quickly from those times of fun to times of seriousness. He knows when it's time to flick the switch. From holiday mode to work mode or from playtime to work time, he, he understands how to go from one one of those areas to another area. So if you're an older man in this church, 
This is God's call on your life to be like this, to be sensible, to be self-controlled, to be a clear thinker, to be a clear thinker. And the next three traits that this older man is to have are really to do with his godliness. They're to do with Christian virtues, and they are things that we are all to have in our life, but they should be, they should be most evident in the older mature Christian men in the church. And each of the next three traits are, are all preceded by that familiar word sound. Notice there in verse 2, sound in faith, and it means sound in love and sound in steadfastness. And we're familiar now, hopefully, by this word sound. Literally, it means healthy. Remember, sound doctrine, healthy doctrine. Sound in faith means to be having a healthy faith. And so older men are to have this sound faith, a healthy faith. And basically that is because a man who has a sound faith has a strong trust in God. This is the type of man who doesn't question the character of God. He doesn't question God's goodness or God's wisdom or God's power or God's sovereignty or God's love. He has a sound faith. He has a strong and deep trust in God. This man is rock solid when it comes to what he believes about God and what he believes about the Bible and what he believes about his own Christian faith. He's not the kind of guy filled with doubts and uncertainty. He understands truth and he understands that his faith in God is real and it's genuine. If a man has been on the Christian journey for many, many years, you would expect that his faith is like this, that it is strong, and that it is not brittle, it's not wavering, but it's strong because he's seen God's hand at work in his life and in the life of many other people, and so he's, he's solid, he's, he's sound in his faith. And then the next aspect is that he is sound in love. He's sound in love. He has a, a healthy love. And, and this is just one of the, the great character traits of Christianity that we know so well, that this man has a healthy love. It is that kind of agape love that we see so many times in Scripture. It's an, it's an active love. It's a sacrificial love. It's an unconditional love that this man should di display all the time in his life. And so older men are to be, uh, are to model sacrificial, unconditional love to others. This, this is the type of man who is not even shaken when his love is not, when his love is rejected or maybe if his love is refused. It doesn't rattle him. He understands that love is not a feeling, it is an act of his will. And this is the hallmark of a godly man, of a godly older man. And it's the type of love that God poured out for each one of us. And it's that kind of love that an older man must send forth to his wife, to his family, to his friends, to his church, and, and even towards his enemies. And more than that, it's a love that is to extend to his God. He is to love God and love others. And 1 Corinthians 13 would be so true of an older godly man. And that's the great chapter on love, where love is patient, love is kind. Well, this older man would be just like that. His love would be patient and kind and not jealous and not brag and not arrogant because it is a sound, it is a healthy kind of love. That's what you older men are to model in your lives. And then the sixth thing that Paul talks about here to Titus is that he is to be sound in steadfastness. Sound in steadfastness. He, he is to have a healthy endurance. He is to be one who is able to persevere. He has a godly endurance. He is a, a patient man. This kind of guy ought not to be easily flustered. He doesn't lose heart no matter what test he faces in life. And his body is growing weaker, but his spirit is growing stronger. He has this godly endurance. And, and this idea of endurance is the whole, 
the, the picture is that you remain under. It's the, it's the picture of that weightlifter who is, who is standing there underneath the weight of the bar and the weights on the end of it, and he is underneath it. He is standing under the bar with all of that weight, and even though it's such a heavy weight, he can endure. He can persevere. That's the picture that you, we have here of what it means to be one who can be steadfast. This guy can endure. You could say it this way. He, he's the guy who can fight the good fight. He can go 12 rounds because quitting is never an option for this guy. He just hangs in there. He's steadfast. He's reliable. He perseveres. Some would say this is the guy who's been to the University of Hard Knocks and he's graduated with flying colors because he's able to accept any kind of disappointment. He's able to endure hardship. He can handle any kind of physical weakness. He can cope with loneliness. He can lack uh, he, can, he can put up with a lack of appreciation. This guy can just endure. There's nothing in life that can rattle this guy. He's solid. And he's a great example to the younger men of what it means to just hang in there, to be patient and to persevere. That's what you older men need to be like. Now I understand that growing old is not always easy. Growing old comes with its challenges. It comes with its aches and its pains and they come too often and sometimes change for an older person can be a, a challenge to cope with, even the smallest of change. But if you are an older Christian man, these are the qualities, these are the characteristics that ought to mark your life. They ought to mark your life. And remember, the, the younger generation are looking up to you. They're looking at your life. And the question is to your older men is what, what do they see? Do they see these six characteristics in your life? Because I'm sure you don't want to be a stumbling block to them and we wouldn't want you to stumble on your way to the finish line and not be able to, to manifest these qualities in your life. John Wesley is a name I'm sure many of you know. He was the father of the, the Methodist denomination. At the age of 83, after this guy had traveled something like 300,000 kilometers on horseback, after he had preached something like 40,000 sermons, and he had produced up to 200 books and pamphlets of, of Christian material, John Wesley regretted that he was unable to read and write for more than 15 hours a day without his eyes becoming too tired to work. <laughs> How about that? After his 86th birthday, he admitted to an increasing tendency to lie in bed until 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> you need to... You need to make the most of your latter years. Don't give up. You know, older men, older godly men are a real blessing to the church, and, and they, need to be, they need to be honest. I mean, honored. They need, to be, they need to be honest as well. They need to be honored. They need to be cherished. You know, I'm glad that the Lord has given us a number of godly older men in this church, which is a, a real blessing. But let me say this to you, older men, and let me say it very gently. Old age doesn't make you more godly. Old age doesn't make you more godly. You still need to work hard to attain these six characteristics. Not only to attain them, but to maintain them. And do it for the glory of God. And do it for, your, for the good of your fellow men, especially the younger men that would be watching your life. Be great examples to them because then you will be prepared and able to disciple them with your lives and with your words as a great encouragement to them. So those are some challenges and some practical things for you older men to work on. I want to move down to verse 6 this morning and skip a few because I want to deal for a little bit here with the younger men. The younger men, look at verse 6. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Now, young men were basically, as we've said, under 50 years of age. Um, 
So I still easily qualify for this category. It was probably the category that Titus found himself in as well. In fact, when you turned 13 in biblical times, you were treated as a man, albeit a young man. So young men were essentially from 13 years old all the way to 50. They didn't have kind of teenagers and they didn't have adolescence in biblical times. It's like you became a man from 13, a young man anyway, through to about 50 years old. And you know, I find it very interesting as I read this verse here in verse 6 that there is only one requirement for young men. Now, you young men, that's not because you already know everything and there's only one thing you don't know. Uh, it's, it's more likely that they, they <laughs> well, maybe they only have the capacity to learn one thing at a time. What do you think? Is that what you were thinking that, weren't you? But... You know, I think it's because the young men are also to be striving for those things that we've already seen in the young men, in the older men, sorry. So it's not like there is only just one thing for you young men. But let me say this, the one thing that you do need to pursue is a good thing. It's a very good thing. And, and if you live by this principle, it, would be li- it will be life-changing for you. So the one thing it says there in verse 6, well, Paul says to Titus, because remember, Titus is teaching this to his church. This is what he needs to teach them. Urge the young men. And this is a, this is a command that, that he needs to do this. So it's really important. Admonish the young men to be self-controlled. I think the New American Standard Bible says sensible. Urge the young men to be sensible. And I, I think I like that translation best because it r- really encapsulates the meaning of this word here. And when you think about this verse, urge the young men to be sensible, the implication is, is that you young men are oftentimes not sensible. And so we need to talk about this. Young men need to learn how to be self-controlled. They need to learn how to use common sense. They need to learn how to be sensible and Sadly, many young men are impulsive, they are arrogant, they are lacking self-control, they are thoughtless, they are unreasonable, they are foolish. And so you young men, we need to learn to be sensible. And we know what young men are like, don't we? And many times, us young men, I put myself in this category now. Um, You know, we don't like to read instructions, we don't like to listen carefully, we don't like to follow maps, we don't like to think too deeply about some things, right? And oftentimes young men, their body might be moving, but their brain is still in neutral. And so there's a lot of things that us young men need to be mindful of. So it says be self-controlled, be sensible. And, and actually, there's a little bit of a um, kind of, as we translate these verses into English, there's a little phrase that probably shows up in most of your verses, verse 7, like my translation says, in all respects. Um, I think in the NIV it says, uh, the beginning of verse 7 says, in everything. And that little phrase, the translators aren't quite sure whether you add it on to the young men bit or whether you include it into verse 7, which is talking to Titus. I think, I mean, in many ways it doesn't really matter, but I think the verse could say this, urge the young men to be sensible in all things. And so that phrase actually goes with the young men. But the principle is still the same. It doesn't matter which way you take it. But let me say this. You young men need to be sensible in all things. Let me give you a few things to think about. Be sensible with your money. Don't waste it. Be a good steward of it. Young men, especially you younger, younger young men, don't borrow $20,000 to buy a car. That's not wise or sensible. Learn to save your money. Be sensible with your money. Young men, be sensible with your fun. Think about the consequences of your actions. When you want to have fun, ask yourself this question, will somebody else be offended by what I want to do? Will or is it possible that somebody else could get hurt? I remember reading about some guys, their mate was about to get married, so they had their stag do whatever it was, and they thought it would be funny to uh, put them through a car wash, strapped, to the roof rack, it killed him. They wanted to have fun, but the guy died. Will your fun hurt anybody? Think about who will be offended. Will it tarnish the reputation of Christ? Will it tarnish the reputation of the church or even of your family? I mean, think about these, when you want to do these things, think about the consequences. Because what might seem funny to you may not be so funny to somebody else. 
Be sensible with your money. Be sensible with your fun. Be sensible with your time. Don't waste your time. Don't exhaust your body clock by staying up till 2 o'clock in the morning and then getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning. Rest, relax. Be sensible with your time. You need to have a clear mind so that you can make sound decisions. Be sensible even as you think about society. Life is going to hit you hard from every direction. We live in a godless society, and for those of you young men who are perhaps a bit younger, maybe in your late teens and early 20s, the academic institutions that you might go to are going to hit you hard because they are humanistic to the core, and they attack Christianity at every level. So you need to be sensible. You need to be prepared. You need to be aware of these things. Young men, not only that, not only academic institutions, be sensible because you're going to be lured and attacked by ungodly females. And not only that, you're going to be exposed to relentless, immoral marketing in the media everywhere you look. You need to be sensible. You need to understand that that's going to happen and know how to respond to those things. You, need, you are going to need to use every one of your brain cells to make wise decisions, you young men. Even in the church, uh, thinking back to the situation here in Crete, the young men were being corrupted by false teaching. And so young men, you need to prepare your minds for the spiritual battles that you are going to face in life. You need to arm yourself with the truth. You need to learn how to detect error. Uh, you know, don't go off to a new job or off to an educational institution that you have not first prepared yourself for and got spiritual weapons to be able to overcome the battles that you're going to have to face. Because if you're not ready, you will get eaten alive in some of these places. I've seen it happen too many times. So young men, you need to sharpen your minds. You need to make sensible choices. You need to be discerning in everything that you do. And you might ask the question, well, how... How can I be sensible? How can I have a healthy mind? And you guys know the answer to that already. You know how to have a healthy mind. You need to saturate it with the Word of God because when you do that, you will know how to respond. You'll know the will of God in your life. There is no other method. You need to know the truth. That is your defense mechanism for this society and for everything that you're going to face in life. You know, this, it's the truth that's going to save you. It's the truth that's going to guide you. It's the truth that's going to protect you. And the Bible says if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And so you need to be solidly aware of the truth. And there's a lot more things we could say to you, young men. There's lots more practical examples. We could talk about relationships. We could talk about your relationships with the opposite sex. We could talk about relationships in home, but we'll have to save that for another time. Just know this, young men. You need to be sensible. You need to be a clear thinker. Be a clear thinker. And so here's a portrait of what we want the men to be in this church. You older men and you younger men, these are the qualities that you need to be pursuing. You need to be strengthening these things in your life because a healthy church is full of healthy men who display these very characteristics. And maybe you need help with these things. Maybe you're struggling with some of these issues. Well, I'd love to help you. Or if someone else in this church can come alongside you and help you, we'd love to do that. If you younger guys are struggling with some of these things, seek out somebody who's older and more mature that you can... Get alongside. You, you, you older men, look out for those younger guys. Get to know them, help them, love them, encourage them, disciple them, mentor them like God would want you to. And so these are great practical principles for all of us. This is sound doctrine being fleshed out in the church and what, and what it looks like. So I pray that God would help us to be these kind of men here at Onikawa Bible Church. And ladies, don't forget next week we're going to give you some biblical counsel on how to be the kind of woman that God wants you to be. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we're thankful that the Word of God is alive and powerful and active and relevant for all of us especially for us men here today. I pray that you would take these truths and, Lord, make them evident, relevant, 
in each of our lives. Lord, none of us are perfect and we desperately need your help to uh, even live the way that you want us to. So help us to trust in you, to depend on this, your word, to depend on your strength, to depend on the spirit of God working in our hearts and in our lives. But Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to be obedient to these characteristics that you've called us to. And Lord, for the ladies as well, I pray that you would give them hearts that are willing to learn and to grow. And even as we look next week at a section for them, I pray that they would come with hearts ready to be encouraged by the truth. And Father, for the rest of this day, we commit it to you. We pray for our time of fellowship now as we enjoy lunch together. Thank you for providing for all of our needs, for the food that we will enjoy. Thank you for each person who has served to, pre to prepare and to provide the food for us. Lord, bless that time and the meeting that we'll have later on today. And Lord, as we will head out into the week this week, I pray for your guidance, for your help, for those who go off to work, for those who are at home, for those who may be traveling, whoever, Lord, we, we commit each one to you and ask that your hand of blessing would be upon them for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. All right, team, we're done, but you're very, very welcome to stay on. We're not done as a church this morning. We've got lunch, so come and enjoy us, uh, enjoy lunch with us. And if you didn't bring lunch, that doesn't matter. You can eat mine because I don't need it. <laughs>